Welcome to another episode of Business Bourbon and Cigars. I'm your host, Scott Joseph, and today we're going to dive deep into a topic that really can make or break your company, and that's how to better monetize your products through creative pricing and packaging. So it doesn't matter if you're growing a startup, maybe you got an established company, how you price your products or your services can really determine the success of your business. And today, our guest is someone who knows this all too well. James Wilton, he's a pricing expert with over 12 years of experience. He's the founder of Monovate, love that name, by the way, where he helps fast-growing companies capture more value through creative pricing strategies. He's worked with startups all over the world. He's got insights that are going to help you take your monetization strategies to the next level. And he's going to do that today with us by, by sharing practical tips, innovating pricing models that he's either created or he's seen work. Real world examples he's going to share with us that can help you maximize your company's revenue and your growth. And before we dive in, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Me Plus Ultra at MePlusUltra.com and check out the Me Plus Ultra network on YouTube. That way you can stay updated on our latest episodes and interviews. So let's dive in. James, welcome to Business Bourbon and Cigars. Thanks for having me, Scott. Great to be here. I want the audience to get to know you um, and understand this. I love this topic for a lot of different reasons. I don't care if you're a startup. I don't care if you're an established company. Uh, if you're an established company, I think the, what we're going to talk about today could help from a market share standpoint. Obviously, it can help by not leaving money on the table, right? Or maybe you're trying to take a little too much either way, Um but if you're a startup, man, or introducing a new product or service, this is really going to hit home for a lot of business owners and or executives. But tell everybody, where'd you get this level of expertise, right? How did, what drew you in this and now how did it, you know, evolve into helping companies monetize better? Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's a great question, honestly, because uh, it's often said within the pricing community that nobody st sets out to be a pricing st strategist, right? It's not on everybody's mind when they start off their their, their careers. It just kind of finds you if it's going to find you. Um, and that was very much true for me. I did not start off thinking about pricing in my in my career. I guess what I am uh, is a career management consultant. I've been in consulting for pretty much my, my entire career. Um, and I spent the first 10 years of my consulting career just in larger general management consulting firms, climbing up through the ranks, doing that uh, spell at business school in, in, in the middle of that. But I guess when everything changed for me, when I ended up accidentally stumbling upon, upon pricing was uh, I had something which kind of threw all my plans out of, out of the window in around about 2011. I had my, my first kid. Uh, and suddenly that kind of that four week, four day a week travel model that is so popular in, in, in consulting wasn't so popular with me anymore. <laughs> I, yeah. I basically saw my, I saw my son on week, weekends for about the first six months of his, of his life really. Um, and that goes by, and, that, that part goes by so quick. <laughs> it does. It does. It really does. You know, you find out you're, you're missing all this stuff cause you're only, you're only around a couple of days a week. So, yeah. you know, I kind of, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I, you know, I knew I wasn't living my my values by, by doing that. It was putting a lot of pressure on my, my wife who works as well. She was you know, at home raising the baby while I was doing, doing this. So I knew I had to do something else, but I really had trouble because I, I really liked consulting. I liked the way of working within, within consulting. And honestly, I didn't know what else I would, I would do. As it happens, I ended up getting headhunted by a small consulting, uh, internal consulting firm within a bigger company called Relix. Uh, which is a big company which has several businesses which are in the kind of the information management space. And they were around that time, they're all turning all their products into these kind of classic, you know, um, publishing models all into SaaS models and recurring revenue models. And this team focused on pricing strategy, which I hadn't done anything of at that, at that point. But really, I, I ended up taking the job because I liked the team. I thought it would be fun. Uh, and it was a way for me to continue doing consulting work but having much better work-life balance and being able to spend more time with my, with my family. And, you know, what the, the leads of the team suggested was that I'll probably really like pricing once I get into it. Uh, and as it turns out, they were exactly right. I found that I loved it. Uh, it was, it was really interesting, right? I think pricing is one of those areas where not a lot of people know how to do it well at all. So you're constantly facing people who need to change their pricing, but they don't know how to do it. And it's really valuable to have people who can help them think through that and do it, 
um, and do it well. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. You have to sort of get yourself into a different mindset to do it. I feel like it uses your whole brain. You know, you have to traverse the, the sort of the, the numerical sides of things and the more artistic pieces. So well, if we got to use really the whole, it for all those reasons, if we, if we got to use the whole brain, then I would definitely need to hire a consultant. We don't want, <laughs> <laughs> so, we don't, we don't want my whole brain working on it. The, uh, I, I, let me ask you a question. So, you know, without any data for what I'm about to say, my gut, tells me that most people probably, let's say they're doing a startup, they probably sit there and say, all right, we're going to offer this. Do I have any competitors? What are they offering? And they either try to be competitive, you know, depending on their value proposition, right? They're either going to be more expensive, the same or, or less. Uh, but that's probably all they do is sit there. What's the market doing? All right. Boom. And then they probably have a very similar common package. Um which makes it harder to differentiate, right? Yep. All this stuff that goes into—I mean—is that fair statement? Is that Absolutely is that what you fair see? Statement. Yeah, we call that we call that founder base pricing, Scott. Honestly, like it is. And when, when people are starting off with their with their products, it's usually the founders like, "Well, I don't know. I'll copy what my competitors are doing. I'll roughly do this." It feels like it's probably okay. It's probably not great, but I'll roll with this for a while. And they do, you know, and it works. And as long as the product is strong, they are still able to, they're still able to grow. But yeah. then they get to a point when they realize that their pricing strategy is holding them back. And that's when they need to think about what the next, the next level is. Yeah. I, I, I say it, and I say this often on the show, I just assume everyone's like me. Because I know when I started some of my earlier companies, that's what I did. And and that's all. And, and there was no science behind it. There was nothing. So who knows what it potentially cost me? I'm going to find out, I, I hopefully, on this episode and how to fix it. The uh, What companies, when companies come to you with pricing challenges, like what are the most common problems they face when it comes to, I guess, monetizing their, their product service? Yeah, well, there's, there's several different things, really. I mean, the way I like to look at it is that, I mean, if you have a, if you have a product that delivers a lot of value to your, to your customers, which most of my clients do, I tend to work in with, with businesses who have a lot of value to add, then really the pricing strategy is all about capturing the value that they are, that they are creating, or at least capturing a fair portion of, of the value that they are creating for their, for, for their customers. And basically there is, it's very easy to leak value along that that chain, and there's multiple places within that that you can that you can leak it. I think the most uh, common places that I see are firstly uh, around the around the communication of value, right? Like we talk about, you want to capture what your actual value is, but actual value doesn't really matter for pricing, right? What matters for pricing is the perceived value. It's how much the value the customer sees. If they don't see the value, they're not going to pay for it. And I see so many companies who know that their product creates value, but maybe don't exactly know how it translates into the financials for the, for, for the customer. They can't quantify it, you know, or maybe they sort of, they have an idea of what they think is valuable about, about the product. And they just communicate that rather than trying to understand from the customer's point of view, what do you find, find valuable? What's most important to you and put it that, that, that way. And when you're starting from that, you're, you're immediately on the back foot. Because you you haven't set yourself out to be able to to capture all the value that you are actually creating, so a lot of the problem can sort of be around how are we positioning ourselves, how should we be talking uh, about the value that we are that we are creating. So I'd say that's probably that's probably the first one. I think the second one is just not understanding what the willingness to pay is. You know, willingness to pay is a concept I think everybody's familiar with within pricing. It's just how much will customers pay, but the willingness to pay across your customer base is not going to be, you know, it, it, it's not going to be the same for every customer. You're going to have a lot of variation there and you yeah. need to understand how the willingness to pay changes for different types of customers with different needs or different sizes and so forth. And so you have to understand that and then know what levels you should be setting it to. If you can't, then you're probably going to underestimate it and you're probably going to end up under underpricing it there. And also if you're going to price the willingness to pay, and you know that there are different willingness to pay is there, you have to have a system and a structure within your pricing that allows you to set those different prices for different for different customers. And that can be tricky to get around. So you see a lot of challenges there with all the, uh, the structural sides of pricing. And I guess the last piece is that even if you've managed to communicate your value perfect, 
put perfectly, you know what the willingness to pay is, you've set your prices, there's still a very good chance that when you get to the sales motion, you're going to end up discounting it all the way just through the normal sort of course of doing of doing business. So you end up losing that little bit right, right at the end there. So there's all these, we call it price execution pieces that make sure that you get the pricing that you should be getting within the market as well. That's awesome. What, what kind of, uh, and I want to get later on the show, I'm a, we're going to dive into all right, now tell me how to do all that. <laughs> all <laughs> exactly. Right. All right. So I will make sure uh, we're not just going to gloss over that. We'll get to that in a second. But like, what are some of the most, I guess, overlooked aspects of pricing strategy um, that as a business leader, we should be paying more attention to? Yeah. You know, I was thinking, I mean, this is it's a question I get asked a lot. And I think the the single biggest area that I think companies need to think about more, and it sounds incredibly basic, is just make sure you have a good understanding of what you're trying to achieve within your pricing, right? Set, set, set your objectives. Because so many people don't do that. They almost feel like I just, you know, I need to build pricing now. Let me just put something on that on that table. Give, but the reality give us some is... Ex- give us some examples of that. Yeah, like, well, exactly. This is it. Because, I mean, for example, right, if you're a company and you say... You might be super early early stage and you feel that it is important right now for you to just build volume, right? Get a lot of users on there, sort of build that base so that you can think about really monetizing it later. Yeah. And you also might be a company that says, you know, I'm really interested in maximizing my profitability from 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 day one. The pricing strategies that are going to help you with those two objectives are completely different, right? I mean, they, were, they will be night and day different across all the different areas that you would that you would think about. But I think a lot of people just assume that if I'm building a pricing strategy, there is a right way for me to price within this particular industry segment, you know, or for this particular purpose. But you could have two companies that are selling to exactly the same customers with exactly the same product. And if their objectives are different, their pricing strategy should be completely different. Uh, And it's something that a lot of companies don't really they don't really take the time to think about, well, you know, we want to maximize, we want to maximize revenue, but we need to make sure our profitability is at least this bit. And we probably want to be growing our user base by, by, by this bit, all those kind of different things you are trying to achieve with some kind of a, a trade-off uh, on how relatively important these, these things are or the, or the priority order there massively important for figuring out what is going to be the right pricing strategy that gets you there. I mean, is there examples and what would your advice be? Let, let's say, let's say whether you're a startup, and I, I think the scenario can play out either way. So let's say I'm a startup, so I've got a completely new product service, or I'm a new company going into the market, or I'm an established company in an established industry, and I'm introducing a new product or service that I yep. think can really help us. Does it make sense? to have maybe two different pricing strategies. And what I mean by that is an early pricing strategy as you're introducing the company and or the new product or service. And then maybe you've got a goal that says, all right, once we hit this, then we want to move to that. Does that make sense? And then if so, how does that work? It does. It does. And again, it's all based on those on those objectives, right? You find that growing companies, when they're just starting out, most of the time they're interested in driving volume and or maybe driving revenue in like and often it's more like long-term revenue rather than short-term revenue right that's really what they're what they're interested in so you see a lot of very simple structures within the pricing it's why good better best type packaging is so is so prevalent in user-based pricing because they just they don't want any friction at at the point of sale they want to make it very easy to understand and very easy for a customer to make to make a buying decision relatively low prices right so they can get their they can get their feet in 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 the door and with that kind of path, pathway to future growth, right? I've got other packages that I can climb up to. I've got ways of scaling it. So you tend to see a lot of those kind of pricing strategies for those startups and early stage com- companies. By the time the companies hit hit maturity, at that point, they're usually far more interested in in, in maximizing profitability, at least within one of their within one of their um, overall ob- objectives. And when you get to that kind of objective, you're generally looking for much more trying to monetize all the specific pieces of value that you would that you would add. So you tend to you tend to do more of the more granular packaging strategies. So I might be charging for lots of different add-ons and, and things, or I might be 
take not making my my pricing transparent and, and, and anymore. I'm making it opaque because I want to be able to speak to the customer and figure out exactly what their what their willingness to pay is before I I spring the price on them so that I can make sure that I maximize the the price and therefore the profitability of each of each tra transaction. So the stage and the stage tends to dictate what the objectives are, and therefore that also you know dictates what the right pricing strategy is going to be. All right, so let's let's take this scenario, right? Same scenario, and because to me it doesn't matter if it's startup. <laughs> you tell me if I'm wrong on that. If it doesn't matter if it's a startup or you're introducing a new product or service, and I'm already established, how do I start this thing? Like, what, what's the first steps you got to do to build this strategy out to to really make sure you're optimizing to hit your goals, right? So, assuming that everybody's got possibly you know different types of goals. What are the first steps? How do we make sure we capture and maximize the uh, the potential? Yeah. Well, you really have to do your homework with this, right? Certainly, it's not something you want to build very quickly. And honestly, that's the that's the first mistake that I see a lot of companies making, right? Usually, it's like, oh, we need to build a pricing strategy, but we're launching it on Wednesday. Let's let's build it now quickly. It's really something that you know that uh, makes sense to to take your time to do. As I've mentioned a couple of times, setting your objectives and making sure you know what you're trying to achieve is crucial. That's really important. Connect it to your, to your strategy. You need to understand your product and how it creates value for your, for your customers and how that value is likely to change. You know, a lot of startups and new products, you're going to have a, an MVP that you launch with, but what that looks like on day one is probably going to be very different from what it looks like at the end of say the second year. So you want to be planning for how that, that changes over, over time, thinking about the new features or capabilities you might be, you might be in, in yeah. introducing. You need to understand your, your, your customers. So you need to understand your different customer segments and what they need, what their buying preferences are and what they're willing to pay for different levels of value that you might be, you might be getting. And while it doesn't necessarily mean you need to match them or do exactly what they're doing, you, de you do need to understand what your competitors are doing regarding pricing, right? How do they package? How do they price? What is the value of their product relative to yours? And if you can sort of, if you can understand all those different areas together, then you have all the diff all the pieces of information really that you need to be able to build a good, a good pricing strategy. And then it's just a matter of you know, setting your objectives, building out, building out the structure, which involves the packaging and the, the price metric, if there is one, and the architecture for how you scale it, and then setting the price levels around that. I'm sitting here taking all kinds of notes. I, I, I want people either watching or uh, listening. They should be doing the same. Write it down. It helps you remember. Uh, obviously, it's recorded, so you can go back and, and replay. Um, People make fun of me when I, I do notes on this. They're like, you know, you can just hit, <laughs> you, can the, it, right? you can just transcribe it in AI, um, you know, <laughs> and then bring out the good stuff. All right. So you brought this up now two or three times about the willingness to pay. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are the challenges in that? But more, more importantly, how do I figure that out? Yeah. Yeah, finding, I mean, let's just, let's just call it what it is, right? Getting willingness to pay is incredibly difficult from your, from your customers. It's achievable, but it's, it's tough. And I think it's tough because most of the time, even if customers, if customers know what they're willing to, well, if the customers know what their willingness to pay is, they probably don't want to tell you what their willingness to pay is because they'd rather that you right. underestimated it, right? And charge them, charge them lower. So there's often that, that dynamic that happens. And also for, for newer products that come out, you know, customers may not know what their willingness to pay is, right? If you're bringing in something trust, to the market, there, yeah. there's no kind of, you know, willingness to pay is a very complex thing. It's based on lots of, lots of different areas, right? There's obviously a value component, yeah. but there's also an expectations component, right? Like what do I think is fair that it should, it should cost also, you know, it's not that I have a certain willingness to pay for this amount of value. If there's another competitor over here, who's giving a certain amount of value away for a certain price level, that's going to affect how much I'd be willing to pay for a different amount of value, right? So just those other, those other options are going to, are going to change what somebody would be willing to pay, would be willing to pay for your product. Uh, and of, you know, of course there's, there's ROI expectations and so forth as, as well that would, that would factor into this, but like, it's, it's a multifaceted thing. So you really need to, you need to sort of embrace that and think that a it's going to be tough to get willingness to pay data and b 
probably doesn't make sense to just rely on one source of willingness to pay data. We would say best practice is to come at it a couple of different ways, see what comes out across those different measures and extrapolate across, across that. I think there are different categories of ideas that you could, you could look at. So first way to do it is if you have, if this is an existing product and you're thinking about changing your pricing for that, you can always go back and see what's happened um, in, in previous deals, right? Yeah. Now, obviously that's gonna be limited because you can only see what's happened. You can't see what would have happened had you tried something else. But if you have, if you have a sales team where there's some amount of deal making and discretion around, around discounting, sometimes you can see that you know, we, we're constantly having to discount more for this type of customer than this type of customer or more when they're, when they're doing this than, than the other things. So you can sometimes sort of get an idea of, of what the willingness to pay could be just through looking back for that. That's usually something that most companies have, have access to, so it's nice and easy. Second category I would think of is primary research. So this involves going out to prospective buyers and asking them basically. And obviously you can't just say, Hey, what would you be willing to pay for this? But there's a number of different techniques that you can go and, and use to get willing to pay. I think Van Westendorp is one of the, uh, the easiest and most accessible ways of doing that. It basically involves asking them to define four different price levels. What, for is, what is this? What was that? Say that again. It's called Van Westendorp. Uh, it's named after the guy who invented it. Um, but and it's quite, you know, it's kind of an oldie but but goodie within this. The idea is that you say, you, you define your product and you say, okay, tell me at what price level would you consider this to be a bargain? At what price level would you now consider this to be starting to get expensive, but you'd still consider it? Now tell me at what price level would you consider this now to be so expensive that there's no way you would buy it any, any, anymore? And then tell me at what price would this be so cheap that you'd start to question the quality of, of the product if somebody sold it for that? So assuming I'm assuming you want to be in the bargain part, right? <laughs> Ideally, I mean, the, really where I'd say you want to be is between those two middle levels that we said, right? Between the bargain and between the starting to get expensive. That's really, right. the, that's okay. really the sweet spot most of the time. Again, depending on objectives, right? If you're really trying to push volume, you might want to be even, even right. cheaper than that. But most of the time, that's where you want to be. But it, it taps into the idea that there's not like one magic price for every customer. There is a range of viable prices that you could that you could get to, and you're probably going to get different purchasing probability depending on where you land within that. So if you can understand that range across all the sort of the different prospective customers that you might be selling to, you can figure out what's the price level where you're going to maximize volume, what's the price level where you're going to maximize revenue. And if you've got good understanding of your cost, you can say, what's going to be the price level where I maximize my, my profitability. Yeah. But there are other techniques as well. I mean, conjoined is something that's often used within PLG and consumer, consumer products. There's, there's many different techniques within, within there. And then I would say the last category to think about as well is a bucket I'd call economic value es estimation. So this is where you, you're not going out and asking what willingness to pay is. You're trying to understand what the actual value is for a customer of different, of different profiles. And then if you assume a reasonable ROI, and you can usually get some indication of what the ROI would have to be from, from, from customers, then you can kind of back into the price. And that's incredibly useful in those situations like we kind of touched on when there's not really a precedent for it, right? It's something brand new. There's no direct comparable. I got asked once, you know, how would we figure out, you know, this, this service, there was this service that was being pitched, which was a service for extremely wealthy people who want to put like uh, objects and things that they own on, on the moon, just to say that they've got something on, on the moon. How much would you pay for that? Right. You ask somebody how much they pay for that. It's very difficult to think about, right? Because there's nothing like that. I've got no real benchmark or what it should right. should cost. So in those kind of situations, right? You really it, it helps to get down to to first principles. Think about the value. Think about the ROI they're getting, and sort of back into a price that seems seems reasonable. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking through something that I'm involved in, right? And you could have different price going back to the goals and objectives, right? So if I'm hearing you right, the product and the perceived value to a consumer might be that, wow, you saved me a lot. Of, by using this, you saved me a lot of time, effort, money. Love it. And that would be the volume play. Because once they're in and do that, the real money 
is made if they follow through on a second part, um, which still can be competitively priced. But at the same time, um, that's where in this company all the real profit, I mean, the big profit is, right? So you could almost have a pricing strategy that says, we want to build trust. We want to get as many people in this front door as this because <laughs> – we need to get them here to, to, right. to the second step uh, as quickly. We still make good money, even pricing it here on the front end, right? It's great. It falls in that bargain category, let's say. All right. It's bargain. We're not too low to where they question it. It's a good bargain. But man, we get them to that next step. It's yeah. all over with. No, exactly. And a lot, of, a lot of pricing strategies will fall into that, right? There'll be some introductory offer, which is, you know, truncated value you're limiting it in some in some way but it's low price so it makes it relatively easy for people to get on and try it and then they sort of they get there they look at it they experience it they see they see the value hopefully through multiple things that you can do you start to introduce them to what the extra value would be if they went to the to the, to, to the next version and then that next step up is where you start you know making making more revenue and, and, and profits out of there because that's where the real the real value is you know and then within that it's it's usually it's usually easier to start getting people to pay something more once they've part once they've started paying something than it is to get them to go from nothing to to something. So well, getting that this, kind of this goes right into key. my next question. Really, I mean, it, what are the different ways that people can package this stuff? Like, what are, what are some of the top, let's say, top two or three strategies that you've seen really be successful? Yeah, within the packaging space, it just lit so. Yeah, that's packaging specifically. Yeah, I mean, with packaging, I mean, in case anybody's listening and, and um, isn't familiar with the term, right? When we talk about packaging, it's usually about if you say you have a, a product, which is a, a cluster of features and capabilities and all these different things that you can do, how do you break it up into smaller purchasable chunks, basically, and how do you sell it? So the, you know, the simplest form of packaging is, is no packaging. Basically, it's just here's my product, take it or leave it. And there's a spectrum of other things that you can do uh, across there. Um, in terms of what is most common and what is, I mean, you could argue this is most successful because it's most, it's been successful for a lot of companies is probably good, better, best, right? This is probably the, I, I have to go check my stats, but I think that around about 70% of B2B SaaS companies use some form of good, better, best. Right. And good, better, best basically means what we were starting to talk about, Scott, right? You have a base version, which is something low value, low, low, low price. And then you have a series of higher value, higher uh, price right. tiers above it. Most common number is three. It's nice and easy to do, but it doesn't have to be three. You could have four or five. It does start to break down when you start, when you start getting to those other ones. But that tends to work really well for growing companies because... It does, like you just said, like it's very easy to get customers in at that low price level, and you have those built-in up upsell paths to take them to the to the to the higher levels. It's very simple to understand. It's very easy for customers to buy, right? It's just simple choices that they that they have. And I think honestly, it's probably one of the more simple pricing strategies to build. Although you know, you, there are ways to muck it up, which we could we could we could talk about. Um, but that one's incredibly incredibly prevalent for all those reasons. However, it's not always the right answer, right? I mean, really, when you when you have a good, better, best um, strategy, what you're what you're implicitly assuming is that if you split your customers into into segments, you have a low willingness to pay segment who is willing to forego a lot of capabilities in order to get a to get a low price, and there are segments which have higher willingness to pay who want more and more things. And a lot of the times that's true, but sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's that you have different types of customers who need different things. And in that case, you're probably going to hand up with a blend of features that they want and don't want in these, in these different packages. And in that case, you're better off going with a more of a modular structure. So, you know, you can pick this bit over here, or you can pick this, this bit over here, or some kind of combination across that. Or well, there's a kind of a hybrid that we see quite frequently now as uh, businesses are moving into more of these platform style business models where there's some kind of consistent base that everybody has to buy. And then you can go deep into specific modules within that, but you're not sort of forced to go up in a, in, in a tiering structure. And you tend to move from those good, better, best style ones to those modular ones as the company matures and they start getting a little bit more, um, 
you know, they start to roll out more features, tend to have more nuance in what customers would would want. So you tend to gravitate towards that as companies get 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 older, but it doesn't have to be, right? You might bring out a new product to, to market and it makes way more sense to to do a modular pricing, um, do a modular packaging approach rather than a, a tiered structure. Okay. I love this next question because I think Everyone fig- try, has to try to figure this one out. How do how do customers or how should I, heck not customers? How do companies raise their prices? And and this comes in a lot of different ways. Some companies have to raise their prices. Maybe they had cost increases, um, whatever it might be. Right. Uh, a lot of people had to experience this through COVID. That's a great example when when supply chain stuff kind of fell through. But let's just say it's not, you know, let's walk through the two scenarios. How, how do I raise prices? And it doesn't matter really why. How, how do I raise prices without alienating or making my clients feel like I'm nickel and diamond them or I'm just doing a money grab? Because I, I got to tell you, with tech companies – I can't stand the contracts where it's got the built-in automated increase. All right. I, I I don't, I won't sign them. I don't do them. So that's one of the things I look for. I, I only know to negotiate that up front with a software company because I didn't do it in, in one or two times initially. Now I, I look, it's one of the first things I look at. And so, I know the I know that feeling as a client or a customer, right? I'm like, they're just raising a the price on me. I, I'm not getting any more value. The technology is not more expensive for them to run. What the hell? And so, how do I raise prices without without pissing off people? Yep. No, great question, right? And that is that is something which I think every company starts to wrestle with. Usually, at least once a year, right? They start to think about should we be raising raising prices? So it's very it's very frequent. And look, I mean. Got to lean into the truth around this. The reality is nobody likes a price increase, right? Customers yeah. don't want that. So we know we're all in, in, in the same place. That said, I would say, Scott, that actually, you know, most customers will accept will accept and expect uh, relatively regular small price in, in increases. And I, I know you uh, you called out your reaction to those those escalators. But actually, I would I would consider it to be best practice to have small like escalators in in your contracts per year, as long as they're small, right? They shouldn't right. be. You shouldn't be saying like, "Hey, the price is going to go up fifteen percent every every year." You know, right. honestly, I have had I have had vendors try to do that to me as well, so I know what I, I know what that's like. But this is more. It's more about controlling for inflation, right? Because. Because year over year, if, if there is any inflation, and there usually is, then if you continue to charge the same price year over year, then you're actually really charging less for it over, over time. That's and you right. shouldn't be doing that. And yep. most customers will kind of realize that if you're just pegging it to around about inflation, maybe a little bit, little bit something more, that seems fair and reasonable to have. And if you can build those into your, into your contracts, then you'll generally get that. And you won't find yourself in the same situation that one of my clients was in recently when they hadn't raised prices for 13 years and they were suddenly priced like 30% lower than they, than they should have been. I mean, it was, um, it's very, you know, and then you're in a very different situation of trying to get I hope out of they that. were getting a lot of market share. Right. Well, yeah, <laughs> seriously. If they weren't, when they got other issues. <laughs> they were extremely profitable when they started and they were not at all profitable by the end because they hadn't been raising their, their prices. Right. So it, it, it does, it does happen that, that way. So I think that's, that's the first thing is a, if you build that in, you're saving yourself a lot of pain. So it's worth, it, it's worth doing that. If you haven't done that and you have to go and raise prices, um, you have to take a little bit of advice, I think, which is uh, somewhat counterintuitive compared to what a lot of pricing people end up telling you. Because it's we should be talking about value when we're building our original prices and setting our original prices, but we shouldn't really be leading with talking about value when we're when we're when we're using a price increase. Because I think if I was to say, if I was selling you a product for like a hundred hundred dollars a month, say, right, and then I say, hey, Scott, by the way, um, I've been providing you a ton of value for this for this product that's a hundred dollars dollars a month, and because I'm providing you with so much value, I'm going to increase it to one hundred and twenty five next next month. I imagine your reaction would be something along the lines of like, 
I know how much value you're providing me. That's I felt hundred dollars was like but exactly. That's a that's a fair price for the for the amount that I was charging you, right? So the fact that you you suddenly figured out you've set value is isn't important. There was a fair price to value relationship originally, uh, and sometimes people will say, "Oh, we, you know, we've added all these features and there's extra things," and then it's very easy for a customer to say, "But I don't want all these extra features and things, so I don't want to be charged any any more to do it." So leading made, with value doesn't tend to work for that. I've made that mistake in the past where I have clients and they're on a, a reoccurring revenue model, reoccurring uh, um, subscription model. And I thought, oh, I'm going to add this because this will add more value, but I got to cover that cost because there was a hard cost associated to it. It wasn't just like a normal tech thing. And I, I thought, well, I'm going to price it to where it's a no-brainer because if they had to go out and buy this, this saves them you know, 70, 80%, they'll all, and they'll all want it. But the reality is, they did not buy the original product with that in it. Yeah. And and so now they're being asked to pay more for something they may or may not want. Yep, exactly. Yeah, customers really don't respond well to that. Really, when you say, when you use the value language for, for a price increase, I think what the customer hears most of the time is, you are charging me extra because you feel like you can, and that's not fair to me, yeah. right? So I think that's, that's what often happens. I would suggest that the right way to do it and a much better way to do it is actually to lean into the concept of fairness, right? Because if you've not been increasing your price year over year, then your, your, your costs almost certainly have been going up. And there probably have been some extra things that you've been doing to deliver better and better service for your, for, for your customers that maybe weren't there originally. That happens a lot of the times with these growing com companies, right? So if you take the, the language of, hey, customer, you know, your willingness to pay is here, your price, the price level I'm setting is here. My cost was originally down here and now it's all the way up here just for the natural course of, of doing business. I can't afford to continue to provide you with the same level of service for the same price that I've been doing it. Therefore, I need to, I need to raise, raise prices. That's going to be far more acceptable to the customer because you're not saying I'm going to charge you more just because I feel like I can get more out of you. You're saying like, look, you know, I literally, I am, the amount of value that I was getting from this this transaction has been depleted significantly by my by my rising costs, and I haven't shared any of that pain with with, with you. Now we just need to reset that that balance to make sure that, that I can continue to do it. Yeah. And that language is, tends to be far more acceptable. They they understand you're doing it from a point of fairness. And after you've kind of got that message over, you can 100% back it up through value and say, and also by the way, here's all the extra things that we're doing to make sure that you have a super valuable experience. Then that starts to be gravy on top of that whole that whole message. But it's, it's amazing how often companies get this wrong, right? Actually, I blogged about Canva recently, who did a did a I mean percentage wise, it was huge, right? They did a 300% price increase on one of their one of their products, and their customer base is up in arms about it. But when you actually think about what the price was raised to, it's honestly, it, I don't know the details of their, of their business and for transparency's sake, they aren't, they aren't a client, but it seems like it's not unreasonable, right? They're still very competitively priced, even with this price increase relative to Adobe and all the other competitors out, out there. So they're still budget. They're not forcing it on you. There are other packages that you can choose from that didn't change, right? So there's still, there's still other, other options. And they were quite generous in saying, hey, look, we're not going to charge all existing customers this right at, right at the offset. We're going to phase it over, over several years. So they did a lot of things right. But I think they, they, didn't, they didn't use that fairness met uh, message or talk about cost. They sort of talked about, hey, we're releasing a whole bunch of new AI features, which yeah. gets the reaction, I don't want the AI features, <laughs> right? So there's, 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 there's pushback around around that. And also the, uh, the text in their email message they sent out felt it, it, it gave the concessions they were talking about, but it didn't seem particularly empathetic or sort of acknowledge the fact that, you know, these guys have been customers for ages and they're grateful and so forth. So I think it just kind of got customers backs up. It could have been, it probably could have been a lot better had they executed it slightly differently. Yeah. So what you're saying is, you know, Early on in this show, we, we talked about uh, some of the things that people need to do, uh, and you talked about communication, right? But that was building or launching something. Um, but it's still, I mean, it doesn't matter if we're, we're doing, ma for, for me plus ultra, right? It doesn't matter if we're doing mastermind sessions, anything. Ultimately, when we get to solutions and we start coming up with ideas, 
one of the challenges every company seems to have is communication. It doesn't matter if it's internal clients or external clients um, or the scenario. In the end, you still got to be able to communicate effectively. And so that's, that's, that's good stuff. The uh, Talk to me a little bit about the usage thing. So I know there's some new pricing models out there based on usage. And I've not experienced any of this. I've not done it. I have not. And I, and I don't actually, I have, I do have, I do have one tool uh, I'm using that is based on usage, but I haven't hit to where I've had to pay more. Okay. <laughs> so so right. basically it's saying you get up to this, anything above this, you start paying more. Right. So I would imagine that's an example, but, but, I don't know that for sure. So give us your definition of this like usage-based uh, pricing models um, and then walk us through if companies are looking to do that, how can they transition that effectively? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess where this comes from is that, you know, you go back to, you go back to software in the, I don't know, go back as far as the nineties or something. And it was all about like, you know, you're going to, you're installing the software in different desktops through, you know, CDs and DVDs yep. and so forth, right? So people tend to think about the value as how many how many people ended up having access to the to the product. So this the price metric of per user became very prevalent, I think, because of that, and it's really carried over into the SaaS world as well. It's very common to see like you paying for the amount of the amount of users. Usage, I think, is really coming around because now you can. You can do more with less a lot of the time, right? It's it's possible for a single user to be able to do a lot of work and to be able to get a lot of value from these different SaaS products because of automations and, and because of all the different things that, that the tech allows them to do now. So a lot of these user-based models are not are not considered to be as value aligned now because you wouldn't necessarily expect that a, com- a company or a customer buying this who has a higher willingness to pay would necessarily need a significantly higher number of, of, of users. So the idea behind usage-based pricing is that assuming you can pick the right the right metric, if you price based on usage, it's going to A, be better aligned to the value that they will provide. So you're going to end up price differentiating more, more um, effectively. Plus, we know that you know if you tend to in, if you value a product more, you tend to use it more. So you might naturally expect the usage to kind of to rise over over time, and that leads to higher revenues over time if, you, if you're pricing based on it. So that's the idea, right? I mean, it's and it's definitely compelling, uh, and it can be great when you when you do it. I think the issue is that because usage based pricing is trendy a lot of companies think oh we should be doing usage based pricing let's do it and i have to say as somebody who has built more usage based pricing models than i can possibly think about right it, it is it is not right for everybody right it is I, not i can true. tell you as a as a client i would not like it yeah well this is this is the thing i mean cuz i can't sorry, budget for that i can't budget for that exactly exactly that's one of the things right we say like usage based pricing is often extremely unpredictable right cuz you know pick a this is a metric i'm not seeing used so often now but used to be used a lot a few a few years ago was api calls right like i have i have a i have some kind of technology and it's pinging other other um, softwares, and I know that that sort of drives value those those, those connections. Therefore, I'm going to charge you based on 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 the number of, of, of API calls. How many a- API calls do you think you're going to make a year? Unless you're like extremely technical, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> like you've got no I- idea what that what that could be. You don't know what it's going to be. You don't know how it's going to change over over year. So while you might theoretically believe that maybe it's a metric that makes that makes sense. You don't know what you're going to end up paying if you're just paying directly for that. And as you say, Scott, right, like that can make that can be difficult for your, your budgeting because you don't know what you're going to end up um, paying for this, this this software. And that's one of the big the big challenges. It's also true that for use, it's not always the case that usage is di- is directly linked to, to to value, right? You might say that you know if I pick if I pick API calls again, right? You might say, hey, do you get do you get more value for you know, a hundred thousand API calls and ten API calls. Yeah, that sounds right. Do you get ten t- ten thousand times as much value? I don't know if I agree with that. Right? It might be more, but I don't know that it's necessarily that much more. So, a lot of these use- early usage based pricing systems tended to have like a linear progression between the metric and price, and you could end up with crazy price levels quite quickly. And they they wouldn't necessarily like the willingness to pay would not scale as fast as as, as the price does. 
So there's those, there's those challenges with it. And I think for this reason, we're seeing a bit of a pullback from the usage-based pricings in the way that people originally imagined them, right? And the idea that like, I'm literally just going to measure how much you use it and I'm going to charge you based on how much you used it each month. So your payments go up and down all, all the time. They're moving more towards these, they're being called hybrid models now, which have some of an element of the kind of the typical flat subscription and some of an element of, of usage-based pricing. And one of the ones that I like the best here is the idea of your, it's, it's, it's termed a usage-based uh, sub subscription with the idea being that you're paying a flat amount per year based on a certain amount of, of, of usage. So a company would say, you know, there are these different bands. If you're between point A and point B with usage, you're going to pay this much. If it's point B to, B to C, it's going to be this much. Your first year, from what we know about you, we think your usage is going to be about this. So you're going to end up paying a flat price based on that. At the end of that sort of contracted year period, if the usage is higher than that, then you'll move up to that different different band and do that for the for, for the next year. But all this oscillating around goes goes away, which makes it a lot more easy to budget for. And I think as a vendor, right, it also means that you're now getting recurring revenue, whereas you weren't in the original usage based pricing strategy because you know it's jumping around the whole time. It's really it's it's reoccurring revenue. You can't ever guarantee what your revenue per month is going is going to be with that banded structure where it's fixed for a year period it is recurring revenue and you tend to get better multiples on that you know you know what i love about it from if i'm the if i'm the company doing it and in, in pricing that way and all companies should be doing this anyways but when your profit when your top and bottom line directly go into that in other words the more people use it the more we're going to get top line and bottom line Man, it really allows you to hone in and focus on how do we offer so much value in this tool that people are on it nonstop, you know? So you'd be constantly trying to innovate and come up with breakthroughs and groundbreaking things to where you're like, now you can do this with it. And you're not charging extra because it's all about the usage. Now you can do this and you can do this and you're making things easy. I'm saving them time. I'm saving them effort um, to where they're just, I don't want to say dependent, but man, that would be my goal as a company is just to really drive so much value. They couldn't get off it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and it's also um, we haven't even covered the fact that um, in some cases, right? It's it's not always a given that usage is going to go up as the value goes up, right? I mean, you think about it. Like, imagine I worked with a client once who had kind of a, a plugin for for websites and internal um, internal t tools that provided search fun functionality, basically allowed you to do clever searches for things. So. Within that, right? So A, it was kind of, you know, it was, it was web, web 3.0. So generally, every time you hit a key, it's a different search, right? So if I'm searching for, for bear, it's like a type B, it's a search. I add an E, it's another search. And it keeps on searching within, within that. So really, if I was pricing based on searches, by the time I've typed bear, I've actually done four searches rather than one search. Yeah. Right? Um, and then also, right, as the product gets better and you think about it, you know, you, you think about when you're searching for something on, on Google, typically you'll search for something, you'll get a bunch of lists. It's not quite exactly what you're looking for. So you think about trying to search again and pulling up a different set of things until you kind of figure out the, the thing that you need. As the search functionality improves, the amount of times you have to research tends to go down, right? So you think if you tie it, if you would, if they were to tie it explicitly to those, to those searches, then over time, as their product improves, they might actually expect their number of searches to, to decrease. Now, we got around that in, that in that case by defining searches differently. It was more about like a search session. So all the searches within a certain sort of block of time separated by a certain amount of time all kind of counted as one. So you control for that. But I think it's a, it's a good il illustration of some of the pitfalls here. You can't just assume that pricing based on usage means that you're going to have this path to increase revenue because you actually could end up with the, with the opposite. Man, I, I just, uh, <laughs> I love what you just said. You can add a lot more value. It doesn't necessarily go to increase the, the usage because, but you know what popped into my head was Facebook. And I'm not going to overcome, I'm not going to act like Facebook's complicated to use. It's not. But man, when it first started off, it was simple. I mean, I, 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 there's so many things that you can do with it now it makes me want to use it less. 
All right. Whereas I gravitate more because, you know, when you're in business, you're using social media to help promote uh, what you're doing. Whereas Instagram is simple. I'm, I'm, I'm going through it. I'm commenting. It's done. I got stories in this and that. And they've added a few things. They've got the reels and the different ways you can do that. So they're, they're getting to it to where it's like you got to study it to really optimize it. But simple gets done. <laughs> Simple just get done. Yeah, exactly. It makes it more engaging, makes you more likely to use it. Yeah, totally. So, all right. So, um, any trends you're seeing that we need to be aware of that you're like, listen, pay attention to this. Uh, you know, I could make the argument like from an AI standpoint, right? If you're in business, you better start understanding AI um, and, and know how to use it uh, if you want to be efficient and, pro and, and productive moving forward. But from a pricing standpoint, is there any trends that we need to be aware of and start maybe positioning ourselves for or, or researching a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think Gen AI is definitely one of the things I would I would call out. I'm seeing a lot of companies right now, even if they're not launching uh, an entire new product, which is based around Gen AI, there's a lot of companies that are launching a feature or a kind of a package, which is Gen AI enabled or has some kind of a Gen AI, Gen AI com component. Um, and then you get into all the, the challenges of uh, of pricing that, right? How do you think about pricing? And I think it's, it's particularly complicated because the usage costs of Gen AI right now are so high. You know, so the the natural tendency is to sort of is to price it based on on usage to make sure that you cover your costs. But again, as we've talked about, like it's not always going to be the case that um, as you increase the usage of Gen AI, you increase your value at at, at the same rate. So that can kind of trap you, right? You end up in situations where you, you know customers may end up having to pay so much per Gen AI. Trans transaction that they don't want to make any any more, right? Or if you're doing packages and you have a certain amount of Gen AI usage, including them, let's say you have like a, you know, you have like a good, better, best, and it's it's based on that. If it gives you like um, a certain usage limit there, then you kind of have to price it, sort of expecting that there's going to be an average sort of amount of usage here, which right. is going to set that price level relatively high for that, which makes it very difficult for the customer to adopt, right? Because they say, well, I'm not going to use it at least a certain level, then this is going to be incredibly high. I think you saw that with the early Copilot, um, um, the early Microsoft Copilot pricing, where they were pricing per user. And the price of Copilot per user was actually higher than the price of Office was, right? Because they were sort of they were baking in all these all these costs to it. So I think there's going to be. I don't think anybody's really truly found the answer yet, but there's going to be there's going to be um, a working out over the next few months, years of what is the the best way to to price this, right? To combine the fact that there is a certain amount of value you get per user, but it's also very dependent on exactly how much you how much you use it. Do you ever do you ever see companies that might do a good job, you know, from a pricing standpoint? Maybe it helps them move their top line uh, higher, but their bottom line <laughs> doesn't grow at the same rate, or maybe suffers even. Are there any examples like that that we need to be aware of and and look out for or avoid? Um, I don't know. If there's any. <laughs> I don't know if there's any particular pricing models that would do that would do that. I do think, you know, you run in, you run into the risk of that when you start when you have when your costs are based on usage and you start bundling certain amounts of usage into these flat packages and you you know, you sometimes see people in top tier like unlimited usage that can get you into a place when you get higher revenue but like very little profitability quite quickly, right? If you end up it's somewhat easy to set yourself up to being able to control for the um for the exceptions. So just like, you know, charge the the five percent who use it over a kind of a reasonable usage limit. Um but if people don't sort of set themselves up for that, they can end up um getting into some tricky situations regarding profitability for that. But I don't think other than that, I don't think there's any particular pricing model which is bad for profitability. I think what's really important is that you, as a, as a vendor, you understand how your costs scale. And you don't necessarily have to scale your pricing in the same way that those, that those costs scale. And in fact, honestly, I'd say that you, you shouldn't default to that because the way your costs scale won't necessarily be the way that value scales. But you should make sure you understand what the profitability is going to be at these different levels. And if there's like a real, you know, if there is truly a minimum that you need to be able to get, make sure that you 
you said that and a you understand you know you understand what your volume impact is going to be by sort of setting that that profitability threshold and make sure you're you're okay with that all right so share with us a company you've worked with right um give us a success story man where with a some company was able to significantly grow their revenue um and it can all be traced back to the changes they made in their pricing strategy. Pricing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's so many like well-known examples of this. I'll give you like a personal one for me that I, that I really enjoyed. And it's nicely, this is one that's not rocket science. It just, it was relatively simple, but just sort of shows the power of changing your pricing. I once uh, did some work for an HR management SaaS com- company um, they were really, they were selling to smaller, smaller businesses who needed to manage their, their workforce. So there was like a, there was a payroll component benefits, et cetera, et cetera, is that, that kind of thing. Um, originally when I worked with them, they only had, they had two packages. They had kind of a basic and a advanced, if you like, I can't remember what they were called, but the advanced wasn't, wasn't significantly higher priced than the, than, than the basic was. And I think when we looked at them, about 95% of their revenue was coming from the advanced version, right? Which really meant almost all their customers were on this, this, this advanced version. So that kind of screams price differentiation op- opportunity, right? If everybody is yeah. buying your most, your most expensive thing, then there's probably a whole bunch of people who would pay more for it if you had a slightly different, <laughs> different price, price structure. Yep. So really, that's what we came in with. We knew there wasn't really any opportunity to charge to change the metric in this particular case. They were pricing per employee, and that was working really well for them at that at that time. But they were interested in changing their packages and their price levels. Uh, so we ended up doing research within the customer base, and we found out that there was there was a set of services and features that there was a certain portion of their customers who attached a huge amount of value to that and would pay significantly more for it, and the rest of their standard their standard customers didn't really care about it so, so so much. And a good mixture of these were, some of them were things they already had. Some of them were were things that they were thinking about um, in introducing. So there was huge, huge validation around, around that. But I think the really interesting thing that came in was we also found another segment here. There was actually a segment of prospective customers that they weren't currently serving who had lower needs than the rest of their, 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 their customers. There are a bunch of these, these functionalities that most of their, their customers wanted. This, this separate segment only wanted about half of that and their willingness to pay for it was lower, right? But they, were, they, w- they would buy something that was this lower spec, spec version for this price and they wouldn't pay what they were currently charging for their, for their standard version. So this ended up with this really interesting situation when they had that kind of standard package and we built a enhanced premium version of this, which included all these, these separate value added things that this high willingness to pay segment wanted. So that was a bolt onto this, this, this top. And they also introduced this lower tier, which was truncated, priced at a lower price, and now created this viable product for this entirely different customer segment that they weren't even, even touching. So from doing that, there was significant increases in the revenue and the profits that they got from their existing customer base because a bunch of them moved up to this this higher tier but they also expanded their their tam and their sales volume because they opened up their product to a bunch of customers who otherwise wouldn't have bought anything from them you know what i love about that that story is not only did you talk to us about all right here's a successful way this can work but it also kind of it walks through it wasn't a startup right you you basically walked us through kind of what had to happen if somebody was going to overhaul their pricing strategy. So it's it's beautiful. All right. So first off question on that answer though, how long did it take you to get from A to Z to, to get to the end from the start to the end when you're working with a company like that, how long does that process take? The process of devising the pricing strategy usually, I mean, depends on who you're working with, but it'll, you know, think of it as somewhere between, six weeks to develop a pricing strategy at the low end, probably going up to about 12, 13 if you're if you're super complicated. Okay. Then there's usually about a again, depending on the on the complication of the of the change, somewhere between a three to six month implementation yep. period. Yep. And then you start accruing the value from it then after you've uh, you've rolled it all out. So if I'm hearing you right, in the in the six month period, you're looking at the first three months could be any it's all the strategy 
the research and the strategy. Then you got to in, then you got to integrate it and actually do you it. You got to put it in there. Right? Yep. That's <laughs> what right, the starts. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got you. All right. So, man, how do how do if people want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, how do they do it? What's the best way? Best way would be to uh, look me up on on LinkedIn. It's James D. Wilton. Uh, on yep. LinkedIn, or you can go straight to to uh, my company, uh, Mon- Monovate there, which is M O N E V A T E. That's awesome, man! I, I got to tell you, get in touch with this guy, especially if you're thinking about if you know you're leaving money on the table, um, or you feel like you know there's a lot of people that probably aren't selling what they should, or sales are flat or just underperforming because the package. Like you said in the very beginning, the perceived value is not there. It's just packaged wrong. And you might have a great product service, maybe even got a good sales team, but it's just something's not hitting home uh, with what matters right, right? The marketplace is the only it's the only vote that matters. So uh, love this, man. I, I want to thank you for joining us today, uh, sharing incredible uh, expertise on how to better monetize your products. Uh, and we talked about through creative pricing, packaging. Uh, you've given this audience, our business bourbon and cigars audience, uh, actionable insights. I, I love when when guests like you come on, and it challenges the way people it challenges their think, and it also at the same time they can sit there and say, "We have to look at this, 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 this," and then things they can go right back to their teams and start integrating right away. So, thank you for that. And for our listeners, if you want to learn more about James. And the work he's doing, like he said, you can reach out to him on LinkedIn and it's James D, right? All right. Yep. So James D. Wilton, you can find him on LinkedIn. That's an easy way. He's very active on there. Or you can go to monovate.com. That's O-M-O-N-E-V-A-T-E.com. Reach him there. And as always, do not forget to subscribe to Me Plus Ultra at MePlusUltra.com and our YouTube channel, which is me plus ultra network uh you don't want to miss out on future episodes they're packed with insights and strategies that can elevate your business thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time on business bourbon and cigars thank you